Well, let's talk about this development with Peter Drobak. He's an infectious disease and global health expert at the University of Oxford and often now on our program, and we appreciate it. Good morning to you, Peter. Hi, Natalie. Well, how encouraging are these trials on remdesivir speeding up recovery from COVID for very ill patients? Well, we should be cautious that it's not a miracle drug, but this is a really exciting development. As your story pointed out, this is the first approved treatment for the virus that causes COVID-19, and that's tremendously important. We haven't seen yet whether it saves lives, but it does seem to have shortened the duration of illness in these very severe patients. And there's some reason to believe that it might even be more effective earlier in the disease before all of the body's own kind of immune system effects come into play when people do get Ticker. All right, well, we'll continue to watch and see how these uh, trials go with it, because as you say, there, there's really nothing else out there, is there? A lot under development, but this is obviously one of the first important new tools in our toolkit, and so it's very exciting. All right, well, a breakthrough cannot come soon enough because a new report says the COVID pandemic is likely to last uh, as long as two years and won't be controlled until about two thirds of the world's population is immune. How dire is that report as far as this being with us this long, Peter? It's sobering, but I think it's realistic. What's really important about this report is like any good model, it doesn't try to predict the future. It tries to give us a, a range of realistic potential scenarios so that we can plan for it. So what they did was to say, well, look, this virus appears to be behaving a lot like influenza pandemics. And so let's use that information to look at what would happen if we move on through time without a vaccine um, to halt this pandemic. And there are a number of different scenarios, but in all cases, the estimation is that it would take 18 to 24 months until enough people become exposed to this virus that there might be some level of herd immunity. So what that means is that we really need to be planning to live with this uh, for the next couple of years. And I think that's important as we, as we look ahead. And couple that with what we know now that some 30 plus states in the U.S. are slowly reopening. And we know that the fall and winter We'll likely see a second wave. Uh, how dangerous is this uh, without widespread testing in the United States, Peter, to go ahead and let people out? We certainly understand the pressures. We understand the economic strain of these businesses. But it seems like each governor is just kind of saying, OK, enough, let's let's go back out. Yeah, there are a range of different things being tried. I think some states are better prepared than others. Look, there's two ways to slow the spread of a virus like this, right? The first are the social distancing measures, including the shelter in place orders that we've all been living with. And then the other are the testing, tracing, isolation, and quarantine measures to interrupt those chains of transmission. Both of those things can work. If we ease up on the social distancing and start getting back to normal life without ramping up the testing, tracing, and isolation, the number of cases are going to go up. That's just math. And so that's one of the risks that we face in places that where they haven't been able to kind of ramp up that infrastructure. The one maybe silver lining to all of this is that by a lot of different states going their own way, so to speak, we're going to learn a lot about what works and what doesn't work because there's not really a playbook for how to open back up. All right, so we'll, we need a playbook for sure. Peter Drobak, we always appreciate your insights. Thank you. Thank you.